okay, we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so welcome to AFO Cafes. These are informal science conversations about all things birds. I'm Valentina Ferretti, and I'm the current president of Association of Field Ornithologists. And for those of you who don't know um, AFO, Association of Field Ornithologists, let me introduce, like, do a short introduction, actually. Um, AFO is a member-based organization um, that's focused on the study and conservation of birds in their natural habitats. And we view ourselves as being the bridge between the professional and amateur ornithologists. And we have a very strong focus in Latin America. We offer grants, um, scientific uh, meetings in South America. We do outreach um, also there. And for also those of you who don't know, this year we are celebrating our 100th anniversary and we have a new look. So you're going to start seeing our new logo. This is a restyled version of our old logo. And um, we are starting to use this logo now. So we're quite excited that we're having a new look. Um, and in October, um, from the 10th to the 13th, we're going to have our annual meeting that's going to be in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and we're going to be celebrating our 100 years. So it's going to be an exciting meeting. We have uh, a great um, set of plenary speakers, and we will soon have our website up and running so that you can register and actually look at the program there as well. Uh, just a few updates. On February 11th, we are having a joint event uh, with Wilson Ornithological Society. This is a members only event for Wilson members and AFO members. And it's about um, how to plan to be safe when in the field. The event is going to have a guest speaker who's just Dr. Justin Doroshenko. And um, he's a wilderness um, first responder. So if you are a Wilson member, you should have already received an email with registration details. If you are an AFO member, you will receive that email soon, um, right after, not right today, but after uh, today's event. Also, just a reminder for those of you who are uh, students, and um, amateur ornithologists that the application deadline for the Bergstrom Awards was extended to February 15th. So just go into the, our website and uh, you can click on awards and you will see the information on how to apply um, to the Bergstrom Awards. Our next AFO Cafe is going to be on February 25th. And um, it's going to be presented by Emily, Dr. Emily Choi. She's going to be talking about Arctic marine predators as sentinels of environmental change in marine ecosystems. And we are quite excited um, and so excited that Emily is also one of our plenary speakers in, uh, for our meeting. Our cafes are sponsored by Avinet Research Supplies and Avinet is owned by AFO and exists to serve uh, bird and bat uh, researchers by uh, providing high quality field equipment, especially mist nets, banding equipment. And um, so if you need mist nets, if you need banding pliers, if you need binoculars, you have to, um, you can go to the address there, the web address there, and uh, you'll find the field equipment that you need. And if you enjoy our AFO Science Cafe, uh, you, and you're not still a member of AFO, you can be become a member and support the continuation of these events. So you can have more information, you'll find more information at afonet.org. So let me introduce uh, today's cafe. Uh, today, um, we are going to be listening to Dr. Juan Manuel Rojas Ripari, and he's going to be talking about cooperative breeding in grayish bay wings. And um, Dr. Rojas Ripari, he uh, got his PhD at the University of Buenos Aires, 
under the supervision of Cecilia de Marzico. And he's been working with grayish bay wings for a while now. He's now a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Buenos Aires and CONICET. CONICET is the National uh, Research Council in Argentina. Uh, so welcome, um, Juan Manuel. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. I will let uh, Juanma share his. The only thing that I'm going to add is um, that at the end of um, um, the presentation, if you have questions, please raise your hands. You can type the questions on the Q&A um, box and the chat box. And we are also live streaming this on YouTube. So if you are on YouTube, you can also type your question there and one of us is going to read your question live. So um, you can participate that way once the, the, um, the presentation is over and we can have a nice conversation all together. So, Juanma. Okay, thanks Vale for the presentation. Now, mm -hmm. Well, do you see the screen shared? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, as Bade said, I will talk about some results I got on my PhD thesis. And the title of this talk will be Family Ties in a Neotropical Cooperative Breeder, Studying Within Group Relatedness and Fine Scale Genetic Structure in the Grayish Bay Wing. Cooperative breeding is a reproductive system in which one or more adults, the helpers, assist others in rearing their offspring. In birds, this occurs in 9% of the species. This behavior presents an, an evolutionary paradox, as helpers are investing in rearing others in others' offspring, compromising their own reproduction. So, dissecting which ecological factors drive cooperative breeder, breeding needs to be answered by setting three important questions. The first question is to understand why do helpers help? And the main explanation by it is given by kin selection, where genetic benefits can outweigh helping costs if they increase the inclusive fitness by helping close kin. The most emblematic case of cooperative breeding being modulated by kin selection is given by the long tail tit. But this theory has its flaws, as genetic analysis have revealed that helping can also occur among non relatives. Here, by engaging in extra pair populations, helper can get instead of indirect, direct genetic benefits. And another emblematic example of uh, gaining of genet direct genetic benefits in cooperative breeders is given by the Malurus uh, species favorite range from Australia. The second question to tackle is to understand how do cooperative groups get together? This can occur <clears throat> by post-dispersal recruitment, where individuals, after failing in their own breeding attempt, will, write, will redirect help to close relatives. Two good examples of it are given by the, again, long tail teeth and the European raven. Another um, mechanism is today dispersal, where offspring are retained in their natal, natal territories and will assist their parents in following breeding seasons. Examples from it are the uh, Florida scrub jay <clears throat> and the apostle bird. However, helping within family groups can arise, can arise passively under fine scale genetic structure. In such populations, genotypes are not randomly distributed on space. And genetic differentiation tends to increase with geographic distance, where after Short, uh, after events of short dispersal, it will be really likely to, for fletchings to encounter close relatives without making an active search. And although cooperative breeding and fine scale genetic structure have been treated as equivalents, the, <clears throat> the reversal of this pattern and the absence of helping in fine scale, in fine scale genetic structure populations has been observed. The, the, most known example of the of fine scale genetic structure 
in absence of cooperative breeding is given by the Siberian jay. The third important question to be tackled is to understand which are the benefits of being helped. As you may know, taking care of their young is costly to their breeders. So having extra individuals, <clears throat> having extra individuals assistance would be beneficial by reducing parental efforts without losing reproductive output, load lightning parental care, and also by increasing the reproductive output with a similar level of effort. effort. Also help, also this extra help will be ben beneficial for offspring as they may, as extra assistance may increase nesting survival by improving their body condition, increasing their growth rates, and also by reducing predation risk. Here in this talk, we will focus on the first two questions. Although it's not uncommon in the neotropics, there are relatively few studies of cooperative breeding with, based on robust genetic data. This, uh, the main examples are given by the cuckoos, especially the guira cuckoos and the, and the both, both species of anis, the newer blackbirds from the Icterid family, the Galapagos mockingbirds, and our South American flickers, especially the Campo flicker, the Colaptes campestris. Well, today our talk will be centered of a specific Icterid, the grayish bay wing, which is medium size and is broadly distributed in Argentina. It breeds from mid-November to March, and it's a second cavity nester <clears throat> using mainly furnary nests, and in a lesser way, greater kiskari and flicker nests. Also, when secondary cavities are limited, it may also occupy nest boxes. It's a facultative cooperative breeder, as we may find uh, breeding pairs without helpers, but in case they recruit, we may find from one to four helpers on, uh, Per nest. It's also the main host of the brood parasitic screaming cowbird, with whom we, the, um, there's an armed race of co evolutionary process that has been deeply studied. And it's also an occasionally host of the shiny cowbird. The first description of the helping system of the cooperative breeder was done by Rosendo Fraga where uh, his study site in La Candelaria consisted in an artificial woodland surrounded by a big grassland make the study site something like an island with a very isolated population. Here, most breeding pairs were assisted by one or more helpers during the nestling and fletching stage. And he observed that helpers contribute to nest provisioning and to nest defense. By observing um, color banded nestlings and adults, he could determine that helpers were mainly, were mainly retained male offspring that remained on their natural territories and directed help to, the, to, their, <clears throat> to their parents. He also observed that screaming cowbird younglings were equally assisted by breeders and for helpers, finding the first connections between brood parasitism and cooperative breeding in this system in the, in the, with the interaction of grace bayouin and sweeping cowbirds. In the study of um, the grace bayouin system, in the next decades, a new st study site appeared at um, the private reserve El Destino, and it was started by Maria Cecilia de Martico, my advisor, where the focus on her PhD research was set it in studying um, host parasite interactions between screaming cowbirds and grayish baywings. In doing so, <clears throat> she described the unpredictable pre laying period of baywings, also the prospecting cowbird visits, the echic behavior by baywings, and the outstanding visual and acoustic mimicry by parasitic younglings. Here you have a uh, fletching of screaming cowbird and a fletching of grayish bay wing. They, quite, they look quite similar. This similarity is also an adaptation. 
because the occasional parasitism of shiny cowbirds does not have a good fate as they are rejected by when they reach this age. After Cecilia, the next steps of the understanding of this system were given by Cynthia Ursino. When she, also, when she started to study the interactions between group parasitism and cooperative breeding and the mating system of the grayish bay wing. During her research, she did intense capture by beast netting and walked in traps during the, her undergrad and PhD project and observed that double parasitized nests with one screaming cowbird and one shiny cowbird, they increased helping behavior, registering a higher recruitment and also higher provisioning finding another interaction between cooperative breeding and root parasitism. Also using microsatellite data, she made the first genetic description of the mating system of the grayish bay wing, observing there was a 38% of nests with at least one extra pair paternity event. She would also manage to genotype eight helpers. Four of them were males, four of them were related males, while she also find, found two more unrelated males to the breeding couple and two female helpers that also were unrelated to the breeding couple. Also during her PhD research, I started here, this is a younger, carer version of me. I started my undergrad uh, research on this system. Upon my term during my undergrad research, I studied the vocal mimicry development of screaming cover begging calls and also study the performance of shiny cowbird nestlings in single root bay wing nests. After that, I started my PhD research focusing on interactions between cooperative breeding and root parasitism in a grace bay wing and screaming cowbird system. But today we will focus on two main questions that I tried to answer with genetic data. First, what kind of genetic benefits do helpers get? And then if kin groups arise from fine scale genetic structure. It should be noted that in order to answer these two questions, I received funding from a Berks from a world. Now the work is under revision in IBIS. In order to answer those questions, we set you the following hypothesis. First, that cooperative breeding in bay wings is given, it's driven by kin selection, where helpers are close relatives of the breeding pair and do not share paternity or maternity with breeders. The other hypothesis we said it is that there's a fine scale genetic structure. Remember we said before a king neighborhood where neighbors are closely related individuals. <clears throat> In the study, baby populations where males are the philopatric sex, while females are the dispersing sex. Under this hypothesis, <clears throat> we should observe that relatedness between adult males should be negatively correlated with geographic distance between them. And also neighbor adult mates should be on average more related than adult females. In order to answer uh, those questions, we had an intense search during the breeding seasons, during three breeding seasons between 2015 and 2017. Every nest we found was georeferenced and monitored until failure of fletching. Upon the second half of the incubation peri period, we started with um, mist netting in order to capture the breeding couple. And after the eggs hatch, we tried to capture the recruiting helpers in order to differentiate between helpers and breeders. Also, when nestlings uh, get the age of eight days, they were also color banded and a blood sample was taken from them. Back to the lab, we did a DNA extraction from individuals of 41 breeding groups, which included 75 nestlings and 97 adults. We did a, a first sex determination on the field by seeking for the brooding patch presence of the, on the breeding females but in order to correct this assignment, we did a sex determination by amplification of the CHD prime of the CHD gene using the primers 2,781 reserves, re, rivers, 
and 2,550 forward, where females amplified two bands, while males only one. By doing so, we observed that 21 helpers were males and only two helpers were females. Once the DNA was extracted, we also as, uh, assessed, we also seek for genetic relationships among individuals. I don't want to, to get very technical on this, but we did uh, DDRAD processing followed by Illumina sequencing. Remembering with the previous data, it relied on seven highly polymorphic satellites. Here we took a genomic approach. This is, we try to, to, to get information from a broader site, from more sites of the genome. By using DDRAD, we digested the DNA using restri restriction enzymes where only the, where the sites where we had double cuts, they were attached with a unique barcode com combination. And after a site selection of the, of the segments uh, cuts, we only uh, remain with 400 and, seven, and 700 base pair fragments. Those fragments were then um, pulled and amplified in a multiplex PCR and then sent to Illumina sequencing. Once we received the sequences, we used that unique combination of barcodes to demultiplex the, the sequences and anneal them per individuals. Once we concluded the individual sequence annealing, we used the bioinform bioinformatic processor stacks. First, we had to uh, make a homologous fragment annealing using the de novo module, as we had to assemble the sequences from scratch, as we didn't have a genome a reference genome. Once we concluded with the homologous fragment annealing, we proceeded to the SNP selection during uh, using the populations module, setting a minimum allele frequency of 0 0.1 and discarding all the loci that were out of Hardy Weimer, Hardy Weimer equilibrium, <clears throat> you getting 356 informative SNPs, which is the main difference between using SNPs and microsatellites. Instead of using a few loci with, instead of using few multiallelic polymorphic loci, what we are using are a lot of a lot of loci in the order of hundreds and sometimes thousands, which are only biallelic, with the main polymorphism is given by only one nucleotide. That's why they are called single nucleotide polymorphism, and then the the acronym SNPs. So instead of getting polymorphism by using few loci with a lot of variation, we will we will get a bunch more of low side with less variation. We hope to get a more resolution by doing so. Once we isolated the SNPs, we proceeded to the relatedness estimations. We, within social groups, comparing between helpers and breeders, helpers and the assisted nestlings, and between nestlings using the related R package and also the maximum likelihood related software. The related package gives a re relatedness estimation that goes from zero to, point, to 0 0.5. It goes from no relatedness to parent offspring or full sibling relatedness. And the main maximum likelihood relate, related software tries to assign a relationship to those relate, relatedness measures that will range from unrelated individuals, half siblings, full siblings, and parent offspring, parent offspring. We also seek for relatedness among social groups doing a spatial autocorrelation using the, the GenLex software. 
the spatial autocorrelation compares genetic distance, uh, uh, sorry, geographic distance with genetic distance to see if closely placed individuals are also highly related and to see if there's any kind of correlation between both distances. So by pairwise comparisons between helpers and breeders, we found both unrelated, unrelated helpers with a breeding pair. Both females were unrelated to the breeding pair, and we found both unrelated, unrelated individuals on the male helping population. Two thirds of these helpers were related to the breeders or the breeding male be, being uh, possibly sons. This lack of resolution we observe between the full sibling and the parents offspring relationship may be due to lack of, um, may be due to allelic dropout, which um, relatedness estimations by using DDRAD is a little bit sensitive. When we, did the, when we did the pairwise comparison between helpers and the assisted nestlings, we split, split the analysis in two. By one side, we compare the relatedness between helpers and nestlings where helpers were related to at least one breeder and when helpers were unrelated with breeders. We observed that the, un, the average relatedness of helpers related to breeders with the assisted nestlings was of second order, and the main assigned relationship was of half siblings. While we did not find significant relatedness among uh, assisted nestlings and helpers when helpers were not related to the assisted pair. This is important if we take into account that when we analyze relatedness within brood, in 25 nests with that had between three and four nestlings, 18 cases of them had genetic monogamy where all the nestlings were sons and daughters of the breeding pair. But we also find 10 cases, 10 cases of extra pair nestlings where at least one breeder wasn't genetically related with one, with one nestling. Although we did find many, many case, many nests with extra pair nestlings, only one nestling was sired by, by a sample helper. Intriguingly, that helper was not assisting the nest where the nestling was born. Finally, <clears throat> In order to analyze the relatedness between social groups, we analyze the resulting um, spatial autocorrelation analysis done by the Genalex software. In order to conduct this analysis, we excluded helpers, so we avoided spurious associations. As we found helpers would be related with the breeding pair, it would increase the relatedness among close uh, neighbors when the separing distance is of zero meters. We did two types of correlograms, one of increasing distance classes and one that broke those distance classes. And then we separated the analysis for the adult populations, remember excluding helpers, the adult male population and the adult female population. We did find that we find uh, genetic structure in our study also reflected on the male population, only significant at the smaller distance classes between zero and 100 meters. We did not find such pattern in females as the relatedness fell under the random envelope for every distance class. Although, although we may see differences between the graphics among males and females, the overall heterogeneity, heterogeneity test was not significant, pointing this was just a tendency. Now, 
summing up and concluding <coughs> the, these results, we can say that two thirds of male helpers were related to the breeding pair or the breeding male. This being consistent with male phylopatry as we predicted, but also that helping can be re redirected to close relatives. We still uh, need to explain why do non-related uh, helpers appear as appear assisting breeding pairs. This may be a case of extra pair nest nestlings, of philopatric extra pair nestlings, which are assisting their putative parents. Also, helpers did not gain direct benefits, direct uh, benefits in terms of paternity or maternity within their social groups. So the direct genetic benefits may not be playing an apparent role <clears throat> in modulating helping behavior in bay wings. But it can also be a case that uh, we, are, we are not taking into account non-genetic non direct benefits, like inheriting the breeding territory. The male bias helping could cause sexual differences in dispersal patterns that may result in fine scale genetic structure as male bay wings were more related to their neighbors. But the weak genetic structure was significantly only at the shorter distance class, showing that the population is not as structured and as it was described before. This lack of structure over larger sp spatial scales suggest that there may be annual movements of adult bay wings. Here, the territorial behavior could be rather flexible, but in such um, flexible territorial behavior, family ties may be kept. One of the most intriguing aspects of uh, cooperative breeding, of the cooperative breeding si uh, system in bay wings obtained by my, by the, my results is the presence of unrelated female helpers. As we found no evidence of joint nesting, crossing out the probability of them having direct genetic benefits. But there's some anecdotal evidence for helping being a road to inherit dominant position. As we do have anecdotal evidence of young floating females that replaced the missing breeding female and took care of the brood without making a, a turnover. Let's say she kept um, taking care of the um, young of, of the nestlings of the previous uh, breeding female. Summarizing, could I answer the third important, important question for understanding cooperative breeding with these results? In order for the first question, as two thirds of the sample helpers were closely related with the breeding pair, gaining inclusive fitness seems to be the main explanation. However, we have to remember that the presence of unrelated helpers may indicate that other benefits are in play. For the second question, the weak but significant fine scale genetic structure seems to point to the dispersal of young males as the main route. But, and also, the unrelated helpers may be extra persons staying at home awaiting to inherit a, a dominant position. In regards of the third question, it wasn't explored in this presentation as it is being developed by current research. One of the results I obtained during my PhD was that I found a connection between survival rate and helper presence where uh, breeding pairs that were assisted had a higher survival rate of their nestlings than breeding pairs that weren't assisted. As we did not take into account confounding environmental effects uh, that may affect breeder and helper performance and their output, now under the PhD research of Maria Savio, 
and the undergrad research of Ignacio Viera, we are taking measures of mesohabitat and prey availability. So we are trying to find a connection between the available resources for bay wings and to connect them with their invest, the investment of both breeders and helpers and the consequent breeding success if it, if it affects the brood parasitism uh, pressure and also the helper recruitment because uh, as we, we did found that there was a higher survival rate in assisted nests. Maybe helpers are preferring more favorable environments. So <clears throat> part of Ignacio's work will be to take a, take a toll on historical data and to see which sites were preferred by bay wings and also if more resource, resourceful environments are also pre preferred by helpers. There's a fourth question that appeared on this system <clears throat> that is uh, going to be tackled during my postdoctoral work, that is to understand how Baywins recognize familiar from non-familiar individuals. This may be a little bit, a little bit obvious for people uh, speaking in Spanish, as the name of the Grace Bay Wing in Spanish is Tordo Musico. You will know why. Vale, did you hear the the song? Yes. Well, I bet you heard the the playback. Yep. Tordo yeah. Musico means musician cowbird, because Bedouins are highly vo vocal birds. We expect that these uh, variable vocalizations uh, participate in, the, in, a, in a, some kind of recognition system, and by recording contact calls and executing playback experiments, we'll try to characterize the Bedouin repertoire to see which elements, syllables, and songs appear in, what, in which behavioral context, and also to test uh, vagueness for vocal discrimination of familiar and unfamiliar conspecific. Stepping further on the study of the vocal behavior on bay wings, the undergrad student Natalia Perusin will study the semantics of alarm calls to see if there's a fine tuning of bay wings of their alarm calls according to the level of threat that they, they encounter that may go from no threats to brood parasites, to nest predators, to adult predators. And also to see if there's a kind of connection between adult and nesting communication to see if young bay wings and cowbirds are able to respond to these different alarm calls and modify their begging behavior. Well, sorry if I <laughs> rushed, but thanks for your attention. And I would also like to thank all the amazing people that made this research possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juanma, that was uh, great. Thanks. And what I'm going to do is ask people now if um, you can stop sharing your screen if you want so that we can see uh, people. You can uh, turn on your um, videos now so that we can see you. <laughs> I'm talking to the audience. <laughs> and um, if you have questions, you can raise your hands, uh, type them on the chat box. And if you're on YouTube and have questions, you can also type them there and we will read um, your questions. And I will start as I wait for people to type their questions. And I, I have a question. You 
found that the relatedness, um, so you found relatedness uh, at a scale lower to 100 meters. And I'm just wondering if um, genetic relatedness among different um, mm -hmm. individuals. I'm just wondering what's the scale for the wood patches? So is 100 meters sort of a, a, a the diameter or something of a wood patch mm -hmm. and then there's another one or is this continuous forest and so this is well, just we we took the 100 meters measures the measure because <clears throat> it was like the minimum dispersal distance that we, we could record and this uh, 100 uh, 100 meter let's say area may be covered by almost uh, every wood patch. The difficult aspect of this is that the environment is not uh, it's not whole forest. It also has like spare trees on on grasslands mm -hmm. where the the separation between forests and nests may be a little bit higher. To in order, in order to, under, to understand how they are, if, if they are aggregated or sparse, we are um, trying to now, uh, you know, um, compile all the uh, geographical information we have from the first data to the ongoing PhD to see if there's some kind of uh, repelling or aggregation by, by bay winds. The, the measure I took was the, um, considering which was the, the shortest dispersal distance in order to see uh, how much I would expect um, I, two, two penguins, let's say one, uh, the breeding pair and the dispersing offspring to be separate, to be separated. That's why I took that, that measure. Thanks. Uh, there is a question by Bob. Bob, do you want to read it? And, uh... Sure. Um, <laughs> good job, Juan. Thank you. Uh, Thank my you. question was, do you know, you, you mentioned the possibility that nestlings that are extra pair offspring might later serve as helpers for adults that are breeding who behave like their biological parents but weren't. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you actually have data showing that they do that. No, um, and, just, and not just the breeders, but also the helpers. No, and luckily we do not have uh, much information of helpers uh, of nestlings being observed as helpers and adults. The, after that, we have very few recites. We think that might be because it's like a very it's an open population. The territory we we are uh, monitoring is as much as we can walk, but we're pretty sure that uh, there are annual movements. But we only have information of uh, a few individuals helping their, their, their breeding parents from observating them. All the assumptions they did of um, helpers helping their, their, their parents or the, the breeding pair was based on genetic evidence. So. I'm, I'm not sure was also how many years passed since that individual was born and uh, the time I captured them assisting that breeding pair that happened to be their parents. So I'm just, uh, it was some kind of, ex of speculation as we, we don't have much uh, observation, observational data. Uh, we're trying to compile all the long-term data to see if we observe some connection and luckily we only have genetic data for eight years and we have almost 20 years of, uh, of monitoring the species. But no, and luckily I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't register that um, event of an extra pair offspring assisting their breeding pair, but I'm pretty sure it, it may occur. I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't think they may have the ability to detect Genetic, uh, genetic relatedness among adults. I, what I'm trying to see if there's some kind of, if they, if they can discriminate about 
uh, among families, but not um, not taking into account genetic relatedness, but let's say social relatedness. It would be interesting to see to uh, to um, uh, to get together the behavioral data I am getting with the um, playback experiments with genetic data, but I don't think we, we, we might be able to do that. We, we don't have enough funding for that. <laughs> not, not this year, maybe in a couple more. Thank you. Do we have other questions? I, I have a question about the vocalizations. I, I gather that that's work that you're about to do, or have you already published uh, work on the vocalizations and could just could you speculate a little on if it's not if it's still in progress on, on what the vocalization behavior might uh, might say about the relationships between helpers and non-helpers thank you uh, with the work is not published it's, it's the first breeding season we are recording we're doing like a heavy recording of individuals and every information we have of vocal behavior on bay wings is based on just observations made by naturists uh, whole decades ago. But we do have a lot of our own observational data, seeing that uh, when bay wings get to the nest, they do this contact call I broadcast. Uh, could you hear that, Vale? Yeah. Well, yes. That kind of vocalization is really used when two individuals interact. And we also observe that not every individual is welcomed when it does that vocalization. So it's after that observation data that we are planning this experiment. So we 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 are also, we we are trying to connect some old um, vocal data we have from my PhD from individuals that were correctly. Uh, genotyped, but uh, that wasn't the, that wasn't the main focus during my field work. So I guess the quality of those vocalizations won't be as good as it should. We are mainly using them to see which recording method was um, was the best. But we we don't have a. We, I guess we won't have that connection between genetic relatedness and vocal behavior from let's say this breeding season or or the next one. I guess we may have in a couple of years. Do we have other questions? I, I, I'll ask. Um, do, mm -hmm. do you know if there is any egg dumping or unrelated females um, laying eggs in, I mean, or females laying eggs in other females' nests. Well, uh, that that wasn't the the key points of the talk, but on the published paper we mentioned that we don't we did not register we not we did not video record females doing like um, you you meant like intraspecific parasitism. Yep. Well, we do not have observational data. But in Cynthia Ursino's work and in my work, we did found um, eggs, or so, let's say nestlings, that were not related to any nestling, nor any um, any parental, not not the breeding not the breeding male, nor the breeding female. So we assume that there are events of intraspecific group parasitism, but I only registered one. And I guess uh, Cynthia with a, Cynthia and couples, and I guess she only found one or two events. So it's it's really uncommon. Okay. It occurs, but in a really low frequency. There's another thing I didn't say that there's a behavior of the brood parasitic screaming cowbirds that is the egg pecking behavior. So we do look we do lose a lot of information because of egg pecking. There are some, uh, we may lose entire broods of, uh, because of uh, cowbirds pecking their, their eggs. So the number may, might, the frequency of um, intraspecific group parasitism may be higher. But from the individuals that 
happen to be born that reach that age, it's a really low frequency. It occurs, but in a low frequency. Yeah, I think that's where probably having the pedigrees of individuals, if you could mm -hmm. see like whole neighborhoods, um, that would be interesting to see if some of some unrelated individuals are actual social nestlings, but not mm -hmm. genetic nestlings. Yeah. Any more questions? Are there any questions, Matt, on YouTube? No? No? Well, thank you so much. And uh, hope you all, um, hope to see you all actually at the next AFO Cafe. And thank you, Juanma. That was great. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>